This is a postscript to yesterday. Those of you who have done your Jeremiah reading today will have read in Jeremiah 31 and verse 31, so it's easy to remember, isn't it? 31, 31, that when Elijah goes out to collect scattered Israel, or Ephraim, as they're called prophetically, Yahweh is going to make with them, it says, a new covenant. Now, it's been suggested, incorrectly, that that's actually a really new covenant. It's not. It's the one we were talking about yesterday. It's what Paul calls the second. He takes away the first, the Mosaic, that he might establish the second, the Abrahamic. And, of course, it's a fact that Paul quotes from Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews chapter 8. And in Hebrews chapter 8, the subject is obvious. It's the Abrahamic covenant. So that just adds to what we said yesterday about these two covenants and their relationship one to another. Though the Abrahamic appeared first like the hand of Zarah, it was the Mosaic, the Fares aspect, it was the Mosaic that was confirmed first by the shedding of blood. The new covenant, or the second covenant, is the Abrahamic because it was only confirmed by the sacrifice of Christ. Would you join me in Luke chapter 15 to begin our studies today on this scourge son received? Now you're all aware, of course, that there's a series of five parables here in Luke chapter 15 and 16. They're all interrelated. They're called the parables of the lost. And so we have the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons, the lost steward, and the lost high priest. Now, that's not the common names for these parables, as you're obviously aware, but that's what they really are, the parables of the lost. And, of course, it's the audience that hears these parables that are the subject of the parables. If you have a look at Luke chapter 15 and verse 1, you read, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And then, of course, in verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured. So you have the two classes who are the subject of this series of five parables. Judah, our subject for this week, brothers and sisters, fits both sons. He's the perfect type of the nation to whom Christ came, of whom he now speaks in these five parables. In Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10, we have the lost coin. And of course, we saw Judah's motivation yesterday, didn't we? He was driven by the prophet motive. And in Luke chapter 16, our Lord Jesus Christ isolates the real problem of the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, you're covetous. They were covetous. Of course, it wasn't just money that they were covetous for, as we saw or mentioned yesterday as well. And so we have the lost coin. Coin because of that fact. Lost inside the house. Remember, that's where the coin was lost, inside the house. And that's where Judah was lost, wasn't he? Until we come to chapter 38 of Genesis, he was lost inside his father's house. It's possible to be brought up a Christadelphian, to be here, brothers and sisters, to go to the meetings, and yet still to be lost inside the house. But then, of course, you've got the other son. And we know from what follows that the parable of the two sons, the prodigal, as he's called, and the elder son, those two sons represent these two classes of people. <clears throat> The unjust steward is the one who writes down the law, as, of course, Judah did. In chapter 15 of Luke, in verses 4 to 7, we have the lost sheep revealed further in the younger son who goes out and spends his father's uh, living uh, with harlots, etc. Well, that's Judah lost outside the house. That's the story that we saw yesterday in Genesis chapter 38. So up to the end of chapter 37, he's lost inside the house. He has a prophet motive. He leaves the family of Jacob. In other words, he basically leaves the truth and he's lost outside the house. So we have in these parables of Luke uh, chapter 15 through 17 some really strong evidence that, of course, Judah is a type of the nation to which Christ came. So let's come back and have a look at the life pattern of Judah. We saw in Genesis 29, verse 35, that when he was born, Yahweh was praised at his birth. We saw in Genesis 37, verses 26 to 27, that he became the betrayer of his brother. 
He was the one that was instrumental in Joseph being sold to the Ishmaelites to go into Egypt. We saw in Genesis 38 that Judah's shameful and disgraceful behaviour as a Christadelphian or an ex-Christadelphian, you might say, becomes the type of the nation at the time of Christ, driven as we've just pointed out by that prophet maybe he had a mind like a cash register. What prophet is it that we, that we just kill our brother? And then we come to Genesis 43, verses 1 to 14, and the change, brothers and sisters, is absolutely remarkable. So what happens between Genesis 38 and Genesis 43 and 44? What has gone on in the life of this man? that he can do a complete U-turn, that he can become an absolutely antithetical character to what is revealed in Genesis 38. What has happened here? Well, we're going to find out what has happened in the life of this man. And we might even see some reflections in our own life, and we certainly will remember what is happening or has happened in the life of others that we know. God is at work in the life of Judah, as we're going to see. And that, brothers and sisters, is very comforting, isn't it? Very consoling. He got to the bottom of the barrel and God picks him up out of it and makes him the leader of Jacob's family. In Genesis 44, the chapter that was read by Brother Don this morning, we see Judah as a spokesman for his brothers. And it reveals, his words reveal this reformed character. And then in Genesis 46, verse 28, we see that Jacob entrusts Judah with the enormous task of shifting his entire family to Egypt. He's very careful in who he selects to do that job. And so it's Judah who is given that task. So we're going to see, brothers and sisters, a remarkable change in this man. So what could change Judah, worldling, covenant breaker, fornicator, hypocrite, into the leader and reformer of his family. What might that be? Well, I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis 43, the chapter before the one that was read this morning, we had the beginning of this process. Genesis 43, and at verse 1 we read, And the famine was sore in the land. Now we're going to see how important that was. And then as the record goes on, because you see, Jacob's sons had been to Egypt. They'd been clearly told, hadn't they? Don't come again and come again. So we read in verse 2, It came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little, a little food. So who is, is it that it pipes up? Who is it that comes forward? as the spokesman for his brothers. Well, it says in verse 3, And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And he goes on and explains that, brothers and sisters, to his father Jacob, who is very, very distressed by the fact that he might lose Benjamin as well as Joseph. So we say here, but what we have in this record of Genesis chapter 43 verses 1 to 40, which we're not going to consider in great detail for the sake of time. But what we have here is a revelation of a new character in Judah. There is calmness. There is firmness. There is resolution. And there's what we call altruism. Now, what is altruism? Well, it's the antithesis of the prophet motive. The absolute opposite of the prophet motive that has driven this man prior to this chapter. There's a definition of altruism on the screen there. It is an attitude or way of behaving marked by unselfish concern for the welfare of others. In other words, it's the Christ spirit. It's that spirit which the Apostle Paul talks about when he says, you've got to prefer others above yourself. You've got to put everybody else and their interests and their eternal welfare above your own. And, of course, we all do that. It's automatic. It's human nature. We do that, don't we? Yeah. It's the absolute opposite of the way human nature naturally operates. 
From the day you're born, it's all about me. That's why babies cry. It's about me. I'm hungry. That's why teenagers do their own thing and spread their wings and disobey their parents sometimes. It's about me. So the intent of the truth in our life is to bring us to be Christ-like. And what was he like, brothers and sisters? Thy will be done. So what was God's will? That he might give his life for the salvation of the world. And we see in him the manifestation of altruism. And that's what he asks us to be, like him. He asked us to get to a point in life where we are prepared to sacrifice all of our own interests that we might devote ourselves to the salvation of others, whether that be, of course, in our family, we have obligations to our wife, to our children, to our grandchildren, etc. We certainly have obligations to the ecclesia and we have obligations to the brotherhood. There will never be a time, brothers and sisters, when you can say there's nothing to do. There will always be people who are in greater need than yourself. And altruism is when you think about them before you think about yourself. And that is where Judah arrives, through the operation of God in his life. So what, what was this process? Well, look at Genesis 42, verse 28. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And there, Joseph's brothers' heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? Now, there's the beginning. When we come to realise that the things that are happening in our life are by the hand of God, including the disasters that occur to us, especially the disasters that occur to us, then we begin a process by which we can be recovered from selfishness to altruism. It's a long process. It took many years for this to happen to Judah. It's a painful process. It's very uncomfortable, but when you get to the end, you can come to the characteristics that are now manifested in Judah. But it demands that we recognise the hand of God in our affairs. So when we go on in Genesis 42, and you read down from verses 29 to 38, as Jacob hears the story of their time in Egypt, he descends into self-pity. Have a look at verse 35. It came to pass, they emptied their sacks, Every man's silver was in his sack. And this is what Jacob says in verse 36. Jacob, their father, said to them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. The Simeon, of course, was locked away. You know why Joseph chose Simeon? Because he was the most violent one of his brothers. It was Simeon who led Levi into the city of Shechem and butchered the men thereof. It was Simeon who stood at the side of the empty pit into which they'd thrown Joseph and said, ha, 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 that's what you deserve. He was the violent one in the family. So Joseph singles him out and says, right, mate, you're in the clink. You're in the cooler. Until you learn not to be violent. See, that's why he's left in Egypt. Very, very selective. And so Jacob pours out this self-pity he says at the end of verse 36, Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and you want to take Benjamin as well? All these things are against me. And his sons are watching off. <coughs> a man with a broken heart. He's had a broken heart for 22 years. An inconsolable grief. He never, ever got over it. And you see, his sons had been there when Rachel died at Ephratah, just short of Bethlehem. They saw the grief of Jacob. When they came back with the blood-spattered Ketanet, they saw the grief of Jacob. It was an ongoing grief. 
He treasured Joseph because of his love for Rachel. And now Joseph was gone. And now the prospect of Benjamin going. They had seen that for years, for decades. And at last, at last, it's digging into them and especially into Judah. And Reuben, of course, he's the firstborn. He steps forward and says, okay, okay, Dad, I've got the answer for you. Look what he says in Genesis 42, verse 37. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring, and I will bring him to thee again. What an idiot. He's suggesting that Jacob's going to lose two more of his family if the wheels fall off. You see, Jacob says, get out, get out of my way. I'm not interested in that kind of foolish proposition. But when you come to chapter 43, we read from verse 8. We read in verse 8 that Judah said unto Israel his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go. But there's no stupidity about saying, slay my sons. Nothing like that. There's responsibility. There's calmness. There's resolution. He's a different man, isn't he? He's a totally different man. And so we see, he says, send the lad with me that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. See what he's, he's bringing the whole family. We, the brethren, thou, our father, and all the little ones here for whom we have obligations and responsibilities. Let me go, Dad, but I can't go. And we will not go unless we take Benjamin with us. Verse 9, I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man of present, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand, peradventure it was an oversight, and take your brother and go. And God Almighty give you mercy. You know what that title is, don't you? El Shaddai. You know what El Shaddai is all about, brothers and sisters? Yahweh as a nourisher and builder of the family. And so when Jacob, who's just been so distressed that he's descended into self-pity, hears the words of Judah, he says, there's no other way. I'm trusting you, Judah. I'm putting my absolute trust in you. Why would he do that? Well, because you see, Judah is now back in the ecclesia. He's back in the family. He's a totally reformed man. This is not the Judah that Jacob has known of old. This is a man that you can lean on, that you can trust, because you can see the changes in his life. What a story that is, eh? And so we're going to have a look in a moment at Genesis 44. We're going to see the consciousness of God that is working in the lives of these brothers, and especially in Judah. And we're going to see the compassion that Judah has for his father Jacob. And... All of this bespeaks the fact that there has been enormous changes in this man's life, in his faith, in his conscience, which is now very sensitive, in his sensitivity to his father's grief and sufferings, and to his sacrificial love, his willingness, brothers and sisters, to give up everything that belongs to him that he might not injure his father anymore. And when we get to that stage in life, we're making a little bit of progress in the truth. When we get to the point, brothers and sisters, where that we are prepared to give up everything that belongs to us, that our Father might not suffer grief. We have altruism. Are you there yet? Can you say, in all honesty, that you're there yet? That your whole life is devoted to the well-being, the spiritual well-being of other people? Can you say that? Well, we're going to see it in Judah. So how did this happen? 
How did this happen? Well, because of this. The disasters that God brought into his life. The unusual divine intervention in the death of Ur and Omen. He must have thought about that. God was at work. I mean, when does this ever happen? That you lose two mid-teenage boys by the hand of God. It doesn't happen. Yeah, it happened to him. And the premature death of his wife. Oh yeah, albeit she was a Canaanite, but he apparently loved her. And she dies prematurely. So he's lost three people out of his family. Lost any? Three! He's suffering grief. And we know this because the record of Genesis 38 says that when Judah was comforted, yeah, he went through a good deal of grief. And because of his grief, brothers and sisters, because he's now going through what Jacob went through when Jacob lost Rachel and he lost Joseph. Judah's going through this. And there are the bitter memories of decades of his father's grief in the wake of his own personal losses. And his conscience is afflicted by a broken promise. He'd been taught like all good Christadelphians are taught from their very earliest days, you do not tell lies and if you make a promise or a covenant, you do not break it under any circumstances. And he broke it. And there's his exposure and humiliation as a one-off fornicator and a hypocrite. And you know, brothers and sisters, there's something very important about public humiliation, isn't there? In, the, in this humanistic world in which we live, which is creeping into our brotherhood very rapidly, people try and hide the things that go wrong. Well, don't expose it to the, to the ecclesia. You know? Just push it, shove it under the carpet. You'll make these people uncomfortable. We're now reading in Mark chapter 5 today, Jesus deliberately made someone very uncomfortable. The woman with an issue of blood, remember her? She comes and surreptitiously touches the hem of his garment. She's healed. She knows she's healed. And she tries to slip away. And Jesus says, who touched me? His disciples said, Lord, be reasonable. Look at the crowd. He says, someone's touched me. And I want to know. You know what the record says in Mark 5? She, she has to own up. And she told him, it says, all the truth. And that's what Judah is going to do in the presence of one who he thinks is Pharaoh, virtually Pharaoh. He's going to make a public confession of all his past failings and of their stupidity what they did to their father and to their younger brother. It's all going to come out in the open. But that's not what happens today, is it? You are far better off being exposed publicly because of the effect it's going to have on you. And if you don't believe me, just wait. Because if we do get to the end of this session this morning, you're going to see it happen in Genesis 49. And the last thing that happens is those words we read. And there was a famine. And this is a grievous famine, isn't it? Seven years of dreadful famine. And that famine destroyed everything which he had built up. His life's assets, his worldly prospects were all gone. God was at work in the life of Judas. And he can work in your life and mine. But sometimes it's not very comfortable. You know when you can get more comfort, brothers and sisters? You know when you can actually be relieved of the discomfort? Being honest before God and everyone else as to where you've come from and devoting your life for the spiritual benefit and eternal welfare of everyone else. Denying yourself. That's when you get some comfort. That's the lesson we learn from Judah. So come to Genesis 44. Now we've got to step through this fairly quickly. I'm watching the clock. The 
step through Genesis 44 fairly quickly. We don't need to go through it, do we? We've just read the story, and it's a repetition. It's Judas pouring out his heart as to what had already happened. We all know this record, and he's doing this publicly before Joseph, who he thinks is virtually Pharaoh. You know, when, when his brothers and his father come into the land, you know what Joseph says to them? He says, God has made me a father to Pharaoh. Huh? A father to Pharaoh? Yeah, probably the Pharaoh of the time was a teenager. They used to make them Pharaohs, didn't they, as teenagers, if the position became available. We got two King, two King Harmon, who, who was a teenager, died at whatever, 19 was. It? So the Pharaoh was probably very, very young. And there's Joseph, you know, in around 40 or so. He's a father, the Pharaoh. And the boys know this. His brothers know this. He's virtually Pharaoh. He can snap his fingers and have their heads taken off straight away. You're going to see this come out of Genesis 44. So let's have a look at verse 14 of Genesis 44. Now, look what it says. And Judah and his brethren. Why don't we just say Jacob's sons? Why does it say Judah and his brethren? Well, there are three older brothers there. You know what it's like in families? If number four in the family pipes up and says, here I am, I'm the leader of this family, numbers one, two and three say, you are not. <laughs> Isn't that what happens? Even when you mature? Yeah. Well, you see, it's obvious, isn't it? Judah is clearly the leader, the accepted leader of his brothers. Nobody objects to him being in the forefront. He's clearly their leader. And the record says that they fell before Joseph on the ground, fulfilling again the dreams which they despised and for which they had tried to put him to death. And then we read this in verse 15. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Watch ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine. And that's not a great translation. There's a better translation on the screen. It's Young's literal translation. It says this. Have ye not known that a man like me doth diligently observe and you see, Joseph's words actually help frame what we then read of Judah's response. That God had also observed their behaviour. And he had found them wanting when he weighed them in the scales. And he was working in their life. God had clearly worked and observed. So that's why we get the answer of verse 16. Who is it that speaks up? Is it Reuben? Levi? No. And Judah said, brothers and sisters, we will find in the rest of the Bible that Judah is always first. Always. Why? Because of complete conversion. That's why. If you want to be first, then convert and serve everyone else. You want to be great, then be a servant to all. That's the principle. And so we read of Judah's confession. He says, what shall we say unto my Lord, my Adon? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? Now, just get the scene, brothers and sisters. Put yourself in this position in the contemporary era. Let's just say that those of you who are Canadians have done something which the government queries, and you have to appear before Mr. Stephen Harper from Alberta. All right? Or if you're Americans, the unfortunate thing is you have to appear before President Obama. <laughs> but you know, what I'm trying to do is to get you to put yourself 
in these boys' shoes. Okay? You need to do that. So anybody here, if you're in the presence of Mr. Stephen Harper, and you had done something that wasn't clearly all that good, would you make a public confession without being asked to do so? Would you? <coughs> Nobody would. You wouldn't come out in the open and say, look, we've messed up big time. And we're foolish. We're idiots. Would you? But Judah does. And that's the remarkable thing here. That's exactly what he does. So what we have here, brothers and sisters, something very unique. Because he says this in the balance of verse 16. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Well, he thinks Joseph is an Egyptian. He thinks that Joseph's God is not their God. Right? He thinks Joseph worships the gods of Egypt. What's he doing making this public declaration? God, our God, Jacob's God, has found out the iniquity of thy servants. I don't think anybody in this room would ever do that in front of some public figure in our society today. But Judah does. He goes on to say, Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, let not be. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace to your father. And the principle here, brothers and sisters, if I might just labour this, and I'm probably labouring a little bit too much, but if I might just labour it, it's the principle of Proverbs chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. Now, I'm shooting myself in the foot here because this will take time. But I think we should look at this passage. Proverbs 28. I regard this as being one of the most important little passages in the whole of the Word of God. There are others like it, but this has been very important to me. Verse 13 of Proverbs 28 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. That word sins there is pesha, it means revolt or rebellion. Rotherham translates it transgressions. He that covers his transgressions shall not prosper. David found that out, didn't he? His bones were eaten out. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them, so there are two steps there, confession and forsaking, in other words, saying to God, look, I messed up, I really failed, but I don't want to be like that. I mean, you might go and do this again, but at the time... You're sincere and say, I do not want to be like that. Then it says this. Shall have mercy. It doesn't say might have mercy. It's a possibility that there might be mercy. Maybe God will be gracious. It says he shall have mercy. Happy is the man. Happy is the Adam. That feareth always. You know what that word always is? It's the word to me that Brother Roger's been talking about. It's the word that's rendered continually under the law, the continual burnt offering. But he that hardeneth his heart, which by the way is the word used of Pharaoh, hardening his heart, shall fall into mischief. So come back and have a look and see what happens here. Joseph gives. Everyone except Benjamin and Amnesty to return back to the land of Canaan. What he does? He says in verse 17 of Genesis 44, I only want to keep the man in whose sack the cup is found, Benjamin. Benjamin's going to stay, all of you, including Simeon, who's been locked up for 12 months, you can all go home. What do you reckon this is, brothers and sisters? It's a test of character. Because you see, they're given an amnesty, an opportunity to escape. But you see, they can't do it. At least Judah can't do this. Because in Judah's mind, he thinks, what if we turn up at home to the house of Jacob without Benjamin? What's going to be the effect on our father of turning up without Benjamin? He will be shattered 
and it might kill you. We can't do that. I'm not going to do that. This is a changed man, isn't it? So that's what we read in verse 18. Now this is, this is probably, as you'll see in the yellow comment of Adam Clark, this is probably one of the most sensitive passages in the whole of the Word of God. Certainly Adam Clark thought so. He said, it is perhaps one of the most tender, affecting pieces of natural oratory ever spoken or penned. So when we read in verse 18, then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Adon, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. You got a picture of that? Can you see what's happening here? You got these brothers standing in a clump, and there's Joseph sitting on a throne, with all the regal power of Egypt, surrounded by his servants, and Judah comes to him, he sidles up to him and says, can I just speak in your ear for a while? Please, don't kill me. Can I speak in your ear? And he tells him the story. That's a long story, isn't it? Brother Don had to read it. It's a long story. He goes through the whole history. He lays before Joseph all the truth. I don't know how Joseph held on to him, quite frankly. Because we know in chapter 45, it says that Joseph could no longer refrain himself. He had to get out of there. He was going to break down. He did break down. How did he hold on for so long? As Judah pours out his heart on behalf of his brethren. What a scene that is, brothers and sisters. That is genuine and full repentance and reformation, isn't it? And that's what God wants to see us in us all. We want to be first, as it were, kings and priests in the age to come. We want to be with the greater Joseph as he takes over the whole world. That's the spirit that Yahweh wants to see in you and me. Verse 18. Let not thine anger burn against thy servant. He knew, he realised the inherent danger to himself of doing this. He knew that Joseph could say, this fellow's a pro I'm in danger. Get rid of me. He knew Joseph could do that. But he puts, brothers and sisters, the well-being of his father before his own well-being. Verse, verse 30 says this. So let's jump down to verse 30. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. He simply couldn't do this to Jacob. There was a time when he could. When they brought back the blood spattered garment and said, Here, Dad, your boy's dead. And they watched him grieve for years and never said, look, it was all hoax. He's actually still alive. They could have done that, couldn't they? But they didn't. They watched his grief for decades. But now it's all different. <laughs> now they can't do it to him anymore. And Judah is at the head of that. He will die. We read in verse 31. In fact, when, when Jacob received the news that Joseph was still alive, he almost died. We read that in Genesis 45, verse 26. His heart failed him when he heard that news. What would have happened if the news had come back, back that Benjamin wasn't going to return? With sorrow, Jacob had endured 22 years from the loss of Joseph. And prior to that, he had endured years of sorrow at the loss of Rachel. Judah says in verse 14, in verse 32 of chapter 44, I became surety for the lad. And the Hebrew word that is used here has to do with, with being a security, you know, standing in, in the place of someone else. And look what he does, brothers and sisters, in verse 33. 
You reckon you would have done this? If you were in the situation, if Joseph said to you, look, all of you can go home. I'm just going to hold Benjamin. You can go home and continue on with your lives. I'll just keep Benjamin. You reckon you would have done this? Verse 33. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. In other words, Judah was prepared to sacrifice his own life, his home, his wife, his family, his birthright, everything. He was prepared to stay in Egypt and send Benjamin home. You done that? You do that? Did you were faced with that? Be honest with yourself. That's all true, is it? There was a man who did that, wasn't there? There was a man. And he came from the loins of Judah. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So to where does such complete conversion lead, brothers and sisters? Or Jacob, in Genesis 46, verse 28, sent Judah before him. He entrusts to Judah all of the arrangements. If you think about this, it's probably hundreds of people involved, lifting up the whole camp in the land of Canaan in a time of famine, lifting it all up and carrying it down to Egypt. To whom would you give that job? Well, to whom do you give the job of setting up what Chan Lake Bible School? The tent that we have our meetings in. Who would you give that to? Someone you can trust. Yeah. Someone you can trust, absolutely. Judah's a changed man. And they come, of course, into the land of Goshen on the east of the Nile Delta. I'm going to move on. Let's come to Genesis 49. Marvellous chapter this. Jacob's prophecy to the latter days, in which the work of God and the lives of the sons of Jacob is prominent. And for that reason, brothers and sisters, three sons are blessed. I want you to have a look, if you wouldn't mind, at Genesis chapter 49 and verse 28. It says this. This is, the, this is the wrapper of Jacob's blessings of his son. It says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. I don't think that Reuben, Simeon and Levi thought that what Jacob said to them was a blessing. But it actually was. It is better to be exposed for what you really are and to repent than to conceal it and be rejected at the judgment seat of Christ. Judah had been through that process himself, hadn't he? And he'd publicly confessed and was obvious to everyone now of the change of the character of this man. But it hadn't yet happened to Reuben, Simeon and Levi. So when their father blesses them, they cop it. They are publicly exposed for what they really were. So that they might go through the same process as Judah and change their behaviour. History does show, doesn't it, that men born into privilege, including Christadelphians, and I often say to the young people that the greatest blessing that God ever gave me is that I was born into a Christadelphian family because I'm quite positive, knowing my nature and knowing the idiocy that sometimes can be in my life, I know, brothers and sisters, if I wasn't born into a Christadelphian family, I wouldn't be here today. It's the greatest privilege that I was ever given. And my heart breaks when I see Christadelphian young people with the same privilege who don't appreciate it. 
That's the history, isn't it, of human behaviour. People with privilege rarely fully appreciate the blessings that they've been given and return back to God what they can. You know, Levi had to learn this lesson. Levi was a butcher. Went in the city of Shechem and chopped up the men. Levi, in the future, is going to serve, isn't he? And grateful and selfless service towards others is actually the greatest blessing you can have. So what about Reuben? Well, have a look at Genesis 49. This is the blessing on Reuben. If you can call it that. Verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. You almost see Reuben sort of think, oh, this is terrific. Oh, this is really good. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. You know, when you read the end of verse 4, you've got to get the picture in your mind. Because Jacob, this old man, is about to die. He's looking straight at Reuben. But then he looks to the other brothers. Because this is what it says at the end of verse 4. He went up to my couch. See, he's, no, he's not talking to Reuben anymore. He's talking to the brothers. He went up to my couch. He's exposed before his brothers for what he really was. That's a blessing. Because when you get to chapter 50, it's pretty obvious that Reuben and the other brothers have come a long way from this record in Genesis 49. That is a real blessing. You know, there were three things that belonged to the right of the firstborn. There was the priesthood, which was given to Joseph initially, and then to the family of Levi, family of Aaron in particular, in the nation later on. There was the authority of the family that was given to Judah, who would produce the ruler in Israel. And there was the inheritance, the double portion that was given to Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, the two tribes in the nation. You know, when Jacob says to Reuben, you are my strength, he's talking about the inheritance, the double portion. The reason they gave the, 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 the firstborn a double portion is that he might promote the interest of the family. It wasn't for himself. He might promote the interest of the family. That was given to Joseph. The dignity that's made mention of in verse 3 is actually about the priesthood, eventually given to the tribe of Levi. And the power is the authority that was given to Judah. So Reuben represents natural Israel replaced by Christ as God's true firstborn, high priest and king of Israel. The term firstborn just happens to occur in Jacob's life 13 times. 13 is the number of rebellion. And Jacob is sorting out the rebellion of his firstborn. But when he's doing it, brothers and sisters, he, Jacob, becomes the true firstborn of the Abrahamic family. You know why? In this record of Genesis 48 and 49, which are all one context, the name Jacob, the natural name, the man who was the heel catcher, that God spent 147 years trying to get his heel, his hand off Esau's heel, the name Jacob occurs seven times. Seven, covenant number. Guess how many times the name Israel occurs. The name that talks about the prevailer with God. The name that speaks eloquently of the workings of God in your life to make you a prince, a prevailer with God. 14. A double portion. Jacob 7. Israel 14 times. This man, Reuben, had to learn some lessons. He had learned them from his father. He could learn them from Judah. The tribe of Reuben was among the first to go into captivity by the hand of the Assyrians, we read in 1 Chronicles 5.26. And brothers and sisters, Reuben has a future. There is Reuben's inheritance in the land, in the future. And if you have a look at that little red, you see the little red circle here? 
That was where Reuben had his inheritance originally. Went into captivity, never seen again. But the future looks pretty good. Reuben is up here. He's just north of the tribe of Judah. So things happened in his life, didn't they? But what about Judah? Well, Judah's got to be first. Right next door to the Holy Oblation and the Prince's Portion. You see, the territory of Judah is going to be subsumed, the old territory of Judah is going to be subsumed by the Prince's Portion. We read that in Zechariah 2 verse 12. You know what it says there? Yahweh shall inherit Judah. And to the north, and we'll talk more about the the wonderful way that Yahweh has structured this land. If I was doing this, if you'd given me a sheet of paper and said, design the 13 cantons of the kingdom, I would have had six above the Holy Oblation and six below. Idiot. The six is the number of men. No, there's not six above and six below. There's seven above. And five below. I'll let you work that one out for yourselves. And we'll come back, brothers and sisters, tomorrow and have a look at the balance of Genesis 49 in relation to Judah.